In the book of Jonah, it is related that the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. According to legend, it was a whale that swallowed Jonah. But the whale's throat is too narrow a passage for a man. Only a giant thousand pound grouper could have even temporarily inhaled Jonah. Although members of the grouper family vary greatly in size, they all feed by suction. When a grouper abruptly pops open its mouth, it can draw in and swallow whole prey nearly as large as itself. There are many different species of groupers, ranging from tiny one-inch fish to massive thousand-pound giants. The grouper is a loner, living in caves by day and feeding mainly at dawn and dusk. It is an independent creature, this fish that may have swallowed Jonah. Captain Cousteau and the Calypso team will try to get better acquainted with these solitary dwellers of the tropical seas. of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula are abundant with many species of tropical fish. Looking for groupers, Calypso divers journey through the underwater caves of Isla Mujeres. The common fishes of the reef, grunts, surgeon fish, tangs and amberjacks, travel in large schools. The grouper is usually found alone. As we penetrate the recesses of the cave and our eyes become accustomed to the darkness, we distinguish the silhouette of a grouper. If it was indeed a grouper that swallowed Jonah, it must have been a giant cousin of this large fish. Groupers are of the sea bass family, with over 400 species ranging throughout the tropical and temperate waters of the world. Species vary not only in size, but in pigmentation. Some are solid colored, some are spotted, others striped, and some can change their color. Cousteau enters an underwater grotto. Hovering beneath a ledge, its dark color blending into the shadows is a large grouper. Groupers are usually friendly and will even respond to hand feeding. But this one presents an open mouth display. Its numerous small teeth are not a serious threat. It's the powerful muscles of the grouper's throat and jaw that crush its prey to death. Suddenly, another loner of the sea is sighted. It is a nurse shark, normally a placid creature. Apparently disturbed by our presence, it creates a cloud of sand as it departs. Now we come upon an unusual twosome. 
It is a grouper pressing close to a shark. The large grouper, alarmed by our presence, is seeking the protection of an even larger creature. They seem strange companions, two unrelated giants huddled together in one small space. There is much to be learned about the extraordinary behavior of these very individual creatures. A diving contingent from Calypso lands in Pacific waters off the coast of Mazatlan. Very large groupers have been sighted here, fish weighing more than 500 pounds. Philippe Cousteau has landed the PBY near a reef where the giant fish have been seen. The large grouper is sedentary and may make its home in the same cave for its entire lifetime. Around its dwelling, the grouper extends its authority over a well-defined territory. When we have met large groupers in the past, particularly in the Mediterranean, we have found them to be inquisitive and playful. Despite some unauthenticated accounts of divers having been attacked by these giants, we have never found them to be a threat. Still, one cannot help but be impressed by the size of some of these fish. The long Pacific swell and the abundance of plankton make these waters more murky than those of the Caribbean. Aboard our seaplane, we carry only single tanks. Our time is limited. We must move quickly. The area is large and it provides many hiding places. Out of the murky depth, a giant grouper. It must weigh over 600 pounds. Neither curious nor playful, the fish dashes away. We could easily lose sight of it in this turbid water. Happily, the grouper never ventures far from its cave. It selects its home under ledges and in caverns, leaving its den only to patrol its territory. To escape the intruders and their lights, this giant heads for the reef. Like an ostrich, with its head under cover, it assumes the rest of its body is also protected. The grouper's size is its best protection. When it fails to discourage intruders, it displays an astounding defensive reaction, created by a powerful shattering of the entire body. This extraordinary booming sound is created to frighten us away. If we had the time, 
we could most likely cultivate the friendship of this fish as we have that of other large groupers in the past. Now in the Caribbean, Calypso sails south to Belize, where another species of grouper is gathering for its mating season. It is reported that once a year, thousands of Nassau groupers migrate to these waters to spawn in one small specific area of the reef. Cousteau is skeptical but eager to witness such a phenomenon. Belize, formerly British Honduras. Its port city, built on a mangrove swamp, is a mere 18 inches above sea level. Cousteau visits the fish markets along the docks of Belize City. The activity there is sure to reflect the local catch. Weighing up to 30 pounds, the Nassau grouper has already made its appearance in the marketplace. I see uh, that in this market you have uh, a lot of groupers to sell. Huh? We have a few groupers also. Yeah. Uh, do you have groupers all year round? In the house, no. This is just a season. They just uh, catch it in December to January. Just a season. Just a season. How many weeks a season? I thought they are roughly a, a week. All along the dock, catfish churn the water as they feed on grouper trimmings from the markets. The grouper fishing season is well underway. Aboard Calypso, Cousteau speaks with Ian Robertson, director of the Belize Fisheries. This very important natural resource um, has been a mainstay during this time of the year for the local fishermen for possibly over a hundred years. <laughs> and uh, the area, which is only 32 miles south of Belize, yes. um, at this spot here, just south of Key Glory, at a place which they've called Emily. Um, every year they erect small huts and a small encampment on the top of the reef. And from there they go out through a small passage in the reef um, to fish, and then come back again and salt the fish. But why there? I mean, is there a reason? Uh, there must be groupers all along the reef. Well, the grouper are all the, all the way along the outside of the reef, but it would appear that at just this spot, they congregate for spawning, it is presumed, because they're always very ripe females, and they are harvested in very large numbers, literally many thousands. Are there some reasons, for example, uh, two different currents meeting there, or anything special that you know of? Nothing that is known for, for certain. Where do they come from, from all along the reef and maybe from further away? Could be, because even whilst they are concentrating at Emily, um, they can still be seen in fair numbers um, along the reef, but not in such, in such concentrations. And where do they go after they... Nobody knows. That's most interesting. I think we will start with this, from south from Belize. Now Calypso quickly heads south of Belize. The gathering of groupers for spawning lasts no more than two weeks, and Cousteau and the divers hope to witness a rare underwater spectacle, never before recorded on film. Thirty miles south of Belize city, Calypso's helicopter is dispatched. Fishing boats dot the open waters off the reef, testifying that the groupers have gathered and that spawning may soon begin. A narrow pass through the breakers leads to the flat, shallow reef where a picturesque village has been erected for the occasion. Native fishermen work round the clock to take the greatest advantage of the short grouper season. The fisherman's village, built on stilts, is composed of self-contained units, 
each with a thatched hut, mooring, drying rack, and holding pen for storing live groupers. When the act of spawning is consummated, the groupers which have migrated here will quickly depart. Cousteau, accompanied by Bernard Delamotte, visits the village. Each year, for generations, the fishermen of Belize have built anew this floating village. Every year, with the arrival of the groupers, it goes up, and every year, with their departure, it comes down. Until now, these fishermen and their forefathers have taken from the sea enough to satisfy their modest needs with no damage to the group of population. But now, with the introduction of the outboard motor, we wonder how many more years the groupers can support these fishermen now entering the age of mechanization. The groupers being caught range from 5 to 30 pounds each. Some are sold fresh at the market. The others are dried or salted to provide food all year round. We divers always have something to learn from fishermen. They don't get much bigger than these. This is about the biggest. I see. That's the biggest. Uh... And uh, they come here to spawn? That's what we believe. Yeah. Uh, do you find the eggs when you open them? That's true. These are the eggs. Oh, ah, yes. Yeah. This is corn. Yeah. I have a fresh one here. Some of these that die, you see? Yeah. That's a fresh one. So that's a big one. So yeah. it uh, shows that it is mature. Yeah. Uh, but this fishing, you have... It's been in a year. Huh? Oh, yes. I imagine it's been way back, because huh? my father talks to me about it. And so my grandfather, you know. Uh, so it yeah. must have been a long time ago. Long, long time ago. Always the same. Always the same. Except that, say, 15 years ago, I used to come here and you, you used to get a lot of them. Much more, you know. Like you go out there in a day and you get three, four hundred. While no, it's hard, you know. You don't get that much. You just get a few. Why do you think it is that way? Well. Too many people come here every year, and they fish them out, they fish them out. And these fishes must be just migrating, you know? They come here, they spawn, and they travel. So every year they're getting scared, you know? So they go to other areas to spawn. Do you know if they spawn, the opinion, they spawn all along the reef or just here? Just in that area you see there. Just in that area? Yes, there are two wow. banks. Well, we call it a bank, right? Okay. It's uh, shallow. And that's where they come annually. Calypso is anchored 50 yards south of the fishing grounds. The reef off Belize is 175 miles long, second in size only to Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Calypso's echo sounder indicates that all along the reef, the underwater topography is the same. Cousteau wonders if there is anything special below that serves to attract the groupers. Eighty feet below, the divers descend into a lush coral garden, rich in gorgonians, hydrarians, and in many other flexible shapes that undulate in the swell. Although close to the fishing area, there is no sign of groupers. Throughout the reef, coral valleys perpendicular to the coastline are similar in growth and water temperature as well as topography. Why the groupers select this small area for their annual spawning is still a mystery. There is a pilgrimage of individual groupers, probably traveling from widely dispersed areas to join the aggregation at the spawning ground.
Cousteau and the divers accompany the solitary travelers to a sandy-bottomed valley where hundreds of males and females of different sizes and colors have gathered. Reef walls and crevices seem filled to capacity. It is an extraordinary sight. We have never before witnessed such an abundance of groupers in one place. All groupers begin life as females and later change into males. Therefore, among the fish that have gathered here to spawn, there are males which were once females, and females which have not yet become males. The love season increases the grouper's appetite. Its eyes are bigger than its stomach. A grouper has swallowed a moray eel longer than itself. At our approach, it abruptly discards its half-digested meal. It is the voracious appetite of spawning groupers that makes them vulnerable to the fisherman's baited hooks. Bernard encounters a grouper with a fisherman's hook embedded in its mouth, and he tries to relieve it of its burden. Fishermen's large hooks are no threat to the angelfish. With their tiny mouth, they efficiently feed on delicacies intended to lure hungry groupers. With their multi-hooked lines, the fishermen manage to catch a large percentage of the groupers that have gathered to spawn. Under any other circumstances, they would not be so easy to catch. In one day, 10 boats may catch as many as 1,200 fish without creating panic among the other groupers. Once more, Bernard Delamotte attempts to release a hooked grouper. It is now free to participate in the spawning ritual. On the way to the surface, the grouper's air bladder inflates. It is now punctured and deflated, so the fish will be able to swim normally within the holding pen. Once the spawning is over, these fish will be sent to market. Meanwhile, much of the catch is stored alive in wired pens. Groupers have been called chameleons of the sea. Although they are capable of camouflage all year round, in the excitement of spawning, they undergo particularly dramatic color changes. Even in their underwater prison, the spawning mechanism begun in open water continues. It is revealed by the color changes. Some darken, some lighten, in a spectacular display of changing hues.
In open water now, we observe an accentuation of color change. Many of the groupers are losing their stripes and turning white. This striped copper is reddish-brown when it first comes into view. Then, before our eyes, it gradually pales, losing both its vivid color and its stripes. The spawning process is stimulated by both the release of odorous hormones and the visual display of multiple color changes. As spawning time approaches, the color changes accelerate. Spawning will take place in mid-water. At Belize, it has never been observed before. Now the spectacle will be recorded on film. A female, heavy with millions of eggs, prepares to join the males circling above to play her role in the grouper reproductive ritual. Along the reef south of Belize, the Calypso team prepares for a special dive. Although spawning seems imminent, it has not yet occurred. The delay provides Cousteau an opportunity to conduct a scientific experiment. Eggs from a female grouper and milk from a male will be extracted to test the feasibility of artificial insemination. Bernard Delmotte approaches a female concealed in a crevice. MS-222, a deep anesthetic, is used to tranquilize the fish. The drug acts very quickly, though its duration is short. Each female carries an average of two million eggs. Taking a portion of them will do no harm to the fish. Revival will be rapid and complete. A syringe is used to extract the eggs which will be kept alive in a plastic bag for transfer to the saltwater aquarium aboard Calypso. fish begins to awaken. Unimpaired for spawning, the grouper departs. Now, to obtain the milt, the divers search for a male. Groupers swimming in open water are difficult to catch.
time is running out, the eggs must be mixed with milk as quickly as possible if the experiment is to succeed. The divers return with the eggs. They will take milk from a male that is already on board. The eggs are translucent. Although they cloud the water, it is difficult to see them with the naked eye. Falco hurries to transfer the fragile catch to the tank that has been readied for the experiment in artificial insemination. The eggs are taken from the plastic bag and are carefully funneled into a gauze bottom tube in the aquarium. Now the milt is taken from the male grouper, previously collected by the Calypso team. The milt from this male will be used to fertilize the eggs in the tube. The milt is passed over the eggs in simulation of the natural spawning process that takes place between male and female groupers in open water. The next day, one egg is placed under the microscope to see if fertilization has taken place. Observing the results with Cousteau are Ian Robertson and marine biologist Philip Dustin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It definitely looks like the beginnings of a plaque. So it may be successful. Uh, so this may be successful, to yes. your opinion. Maybe. One week later, Cousteau isolates another egg. By now, there should be evidence of cell division and growth. We can see... Uh, yes, it has not gone. No. It has not gone. You can see that it has not evolved very much, I think. No, it looks just about the same as it was before. Yeah. So uh, I think that our artificial insemination was uh, quite a failure, but mm -hmm. probably not so much because it was not inseminated but because you can see that uh, probably bacteria have uh, uh, proliferated around the eggs. You can see some of the eggs that are completely enveloped in kind of mucus that was not there before. So the poor eggs have been choked and probably have been eaten away. It's possible. Very few species of saltwater fish have ever been successfully bred in tanks. Once more at dusk, the fishermen return with their catch to their village on stilts. With spawning about to take place, the grouper season is almost over. The Calypso team undertakes a night dive to observe the pre-spawning nighttime activities of the thousands of groupers that have assembled here. that had been teeming with life during the day seems abandoned. In the valley which had been populated by gopers in the thousands, there is only eerie emptiness now. A 
nurse shark on the prowl appears to be the only resident here. We are prowlers too. In search of the gopers at night. Cousteau wonders if it is possible that the groupers have already spawned and left. The fish are still there. Crowded together, they have retreated for the night, concealed in the network of cavities within the reef. is like a multi-tiered apartment house for groupers. Every room is filled with sleepy tenants. They appear to be in a state of suspended animation as they rest in their hiding places. They are sluggish and slow to respond when we awaken them. As if in a stupor, this fish collides with the reef. The grouper seems mesmerized by our lamps. It may be that its biological clock is slow to adjust to our artificial sunlight. Now Cousteau ascends, and the divers are left to collect two groupers, a male and a female, in order to observe spawning behavior in the Calypso tank. Male swims toward a protective hole in the reef, and Bernard is ready. Now a female, ripe with eggs. Bernard caresses the fish to reduce its stress. And then signals that he has a female ready to join the male topside. Aboard Calypso, the groupers are placed in the tank. They are temporarily put in with the mail which was previously collected and which will soon be transferred to a storage basin so as not to interfere with the behavior of the new couple. Still under stress, it will be several hours before these fish become adjusted to their new environment. Another dawn. This may be the climactic day of the spawning ritual and the end of the fishing season. The groupers in Calypso's tank are exhibiting rapid color changes. The underbelly of the male on the left 
is beginning to pale while the female is beginning to darken. In less than a minute, the male's underside turns almost completely white and the rest of its body has changed from light orange to a rich rust brown. The female stripes have almost disappeared. Cousteau observes that captivity does not impede the biological imperatives of courting groupers. Cousteau calls it a kiss of love. And in the sea, spawning has begun. We know why groupers have to congregate to spawn. The fish gather to better ensure the fertilization of eggs before they are carried away by the currents. What is still a mystery is why, over the centuries, they have always come together at this very same spot. It is an awesome spectacle, as hungry jacks hover. In successive waves, hundreds of groupers ascend to midwater, the females releasing at last their millions of ova, while circling males pass by to fertilize the floating eggs with milk. One after another, in spawning carousels, clouds of groupers rise, perform the act of life, and depart. Fertilized eggs are buoyant, and they drift like plankton at the mercy of the currents. Soon, they will be carried long distances from here. Surviving embryos will ultimately populate Caribbean waters far from the spawning site. Eggs are dropped and milt is spread indiscriminately and at random. But there is some evidence of occasional pairing. Some of the females, relieved of their eggs and apparently exhausted from the effort, now rest on the sandy bottom prior to their departure. Some 15,000 fish gathered here to mate. About 2,000 survived the fishermen's lines and procreated. The groupers love jamboree draws to a close. As solitary individuals, these fish have come from afar, instinctively drawn to gather here. And now, the purpose of their migration fulfilled they depart. Soon they will disperse and return to their distant caves to resume their solitary lives. Left behind, unprotected, are the eggs, the promise of grouper continuance, 
upon which the jacks now feed. What escapes the jacks and other fish will be carried by currents to distant places and all evidence of the nuptial gathering that took place here will vanish until next year. For the fishermen of Belize, the short grouper season has abruptly ended. Now their holding pens must be emptied and the live catch they stored during the grouper gathering is speared for market. Their catch has been sufficient to fill their needs without substantially depleting the current grouper population or threatening the future of the species. Cousteau is concerned about any increase in the fisherman's catch and questions the wisdom of exploiting any species during its reproductive period. We could uh, say that the fishermen are actually taking between 75 and 85 percent of the groupers that come there. It's probably okay because it's lasting for dozens of years. But it shows that any uh, improvement to the fishing methods that would increase this percentage to, let's say, 95 percent, that would probably be another story. And I think it would be very important to protect this area against any improvement so as to protect the living of these fishermen for the years to come. And uh, the only way to do this, I think, would be to uh, forbid any spear fishing in this area and any industrial fishing method in this small area, because it's very small. The area to protect is tiny, and it would be enough. <laughs> The groupers we had on board Calypso are tagged and returned to the sea. Alors le 27, mettez-le à l'eau ici. C'est son tour. Perhaps one day, one of these tagged fish will turn up and reveal where it is the groupers go. Along the Belize Barrier Reef, Nassau groupers are evenly distributed, approximately 100 per mile, if all the groupers of the 175 mile long reef gathered for spawning, they would number about 17,000, which is approximately the number we witnessed. So if most of the groupers which spawned here did indeed come from the reef, it means that some of these fish traveled more than 100 miles to mate mysteriously moved by an irresistible core.